Hi, it's Tim again. Welcome to episode 12 of Beginning Fabrication. Someone asked me the other day about cutting holes in bonnets. Um, so I'm just going to show you a little quick, quick way I do it. As you can see, I've labelled that very professionally. So that's my centre point. I've got a few different holes depending on what size I want. So there's eight inch, eight and a quarter, and then eight and three eighths. So it just depends on what sort of car it is as to how the bonnet opens. Sometimes the bonnet will just open on a basic hinge. Um, Tiranas, HQs, Camaros, a lot of those sort of cars, the bonnet actually comes forward as it opens. So you need a little bit more clearance. So that's why I've got different measurements. And also, um, depends what engine mounts they're running. If they've got tough mounts or something like that, they don't need so much clearance. But if they're running a standard style mount, then uh, it's good to give them a little bit more clearance so they don't actually hit, hit when the motor's idling. So, you can see I'll just do a circle. And that's it. I don't know if you can actually see that or not. That's the, the main way I do, do bonnet holes. I've got a couple of different ones of these that to suit six inch and nine inch air cleaners. I think I've got an 11 inch one somewhere too. Um, but then for doing bigger things or more specific things where you need to measure it down to the millimeter, I just made up this bodgy compass just got a nut cert for the pivot, so you can tighten it up. It's just made out of bits of flat bar. Um, I machined up this bit of stainless just to have a point on it. And that's just a, another bit of drilled out stainless with a, a, a thread of a, a bolt into it to hold the pencil. Um, I use this for doing the sides of wheel tubs, because I can measure the diameter that I need. Obviously set this at whatever width it needs to be and then just draw it out the same way as we did the, the air cleaner, just pivot it around until you've got your desired amount of a circle. Wheel tubs don't usually need to be a complete circle. Um, the other thing that I always have handy, this is mainly for bead rolling stuff or just doing things for fun really, is having a few different sized there's the corner there. Old cutting discs and whatnot. So if I need to do a radius on something, I can just use these, depending on how big or small of a radius I need to, to do. And then you can just draw around and get all the different, get a different radius depending on what, what the job needs. So I'll just do a couple of examples. So that just shows three, three different radiuses, I think. I can't see the screen, but just another little thing that I, I always have these hanging around. Even though these are old worn out discs, they're, they're tools now to me. Um, so they always, just they're always there, ready to go. And I've got a few other different size ones too. Um, I mean, obviously unused discs as well if you need a, a five inch radius or whatever you happen to be doing. Um, so that's pretty much my my toolkit for doing circles or curves. Um, and it seems to be all I really needed to do, needed to have to get me by. So 
Um, hopefully that was gives you some idea of some easy tools you can make up for yourself. So one of my two viewers <laughs> noticed or asked about these little indicator recesses that I made for the front and back of this FX. Um, I didn't do it with the bead roller. I did do a test piece with the bead roller, but it was too tight and it just looked messy. Um, so I actually made this thing, which is now rusty, like everything that sits around here. So it's basically just a press that goes in a one of those $99 super cheap presses that you sit on the bench. So, which is basically a bottle jack in a frame I guess so I didn't want those recesses to be particularly deep so even though the female part of this press is a quarter inch deep the male part is only three mil so it doesn't that's as far as it'll push it down so if I need to make it deeper I could cut another one of these and weld it onto onto here and have it six mil so it would go down to the quarter inch but that's that's enough that's just been, that's a bit of 10 mil plate, I think. 10 mil, 3 8, something like that. And then I've just tigged on the 6 mil plate that I, I cut the hole in. Um, and this is just some more of the 10 mil plate. The 3 mil, you can see I've just got two plug welds on it. It's not welded around there at all. Um, and then there's just some scrappy bits, an old bolt. That mounts it to the actual press that goes in there. Um, and then I just welded a piece along the front just to give that a bit more strength to stop it wanting to bend as it's pressing the pressing the metal. And so because the the little press that I used is only like a foot wide, um, I couldn't just put that whole panel in and press it. I've, had to cut like a section out, where's my finger? Cut like a better photo size, I think it was about a 6x4 piece out and, and rolled it in. So, oh, my fingers are so cold I can't even zoom out. So that's the, the indicator story and this little jigger. So you can pretty much make any shape you can cut or file into steel, you can make a press to suit, you just need to make the male and female versions of the shape and just make sure that the, the female part of it is bigger than that part so that there's room for the sheet metal to, to shape inside it. These little circles there, there's another press that I made for a job a while ago. So it's just a bit of round bar. So it's essentially a dimple die but doesn't have a hole in it. So it just goes in the same way, locks onto the, the press and pushes the circles in. So this is the little press. Um, as you can see it's small and it's only six ton but it, for the little jobs that I use it for like pressing out bushes and that kind of stuff it's uh it's really good I think yeah it was like $99 or something it wasn't expensive so just thought we'd I'll just show you a little example so my little circle bit in. So you can see because it's stretched the metal inside there so much that it actually crinkles the outside. Oh, that's pretty normal. So I can just undo that now. And there's the, the thing. So we can we'll just take this inside and and knock that flat. But, um, yeah, this funny little die that I made a while ago, uh, it's come, come in pretty handy for quite a lot of jobs. And it cost only a few dollars. <laughs> I'll just put that down there. 
Yeah, so that's it. Right back of the vice. This, this is just a like a post dolly. This is just a piece of steel with a with a tube on it. So some people set them up on their own stand, have all different shaped ones. Um, I've just got the one. If I need to have some other weird shape in the vice, I'll just use a one of my cheap panel beating dollies. going to do is just knock these sides of this a bit flatter. Just get rid of that sharp bit. Stretch it. So take some of the pressure off from where it was stretched in here so much it means that there wasn't enough room for the metal that was there. But it sort of stole some of the metal out of here to, to put into there and it just disrupts the whole shape of it. Twist out, we can just use the vise just to stop it moving and just physically twist it. There, that's pretty flat now. Obviously, if you're going to do it for a, a job, you'd spend a little bit longer than I did smoothing it out, but it's, it's not too bad for the 10 seconds that we spent doing it. So. It's just another little way of shaping steel. I gave this a quick sand up before just to have a look and see what was going on with this undercoat patch, all this yellow stuff. And you can see that this is all full of poo. So there's a, a patch in here. There's more issues going on at the front than there is at the other end of the sill. Um, it's just got a bit of bulb and some pitting and then the sill itself has some rust holes at the front so I've taken some measurements to replace the sill just up to here and then whatever's going on in this A pillar section I'll just do as a separate piece just to make this part of it easier uh, so I've measured the overall length and I've measured all of the different faces of the cell and I've also got that angle because uh, this angle here isn't a 90 degree bend so I use my sliding bevel to, to get that. I'll just come over here and so these are the two cells, mark them all out at the same time. You can see that's the that'll be the that'll be a fold, and then that angle there is the front of the sill, and then that's another fold there. So that's the part of the sill that you'll see from under the door, and that little return will get folded as well. And then this is the back edge. So this little piece here is the bit that gets folded into the wheel opening, even though. I might cut all this off when I put the flares on, but I'll make it for now. It's easy enough to cut it off later if I need to. So that's the start of the two sills. So I'll get these cut out. And then we'll grab the sliding bevel again and start hunting for our next angles that we need for the for folding these up. Here's those sills folded up. They're pretty basic. So that's the front with that funny angle on it. And that's the 
holds in that goes inside the door jam. So that's the bit that's pretty much horizontal uh, to the ground and then there's the little lip that hangs down underneath. So that's the, that's the shape. Very basic, which is good. And then at the back, I think like I said when I was marking it out, just put that little return in there for the, for the wheel arch. Um, but because this car is getting flares, I may end up cutting some of that off anyway, but I probably won't unless the flares need me to. So the next job will be cutting the, cutting the sills off the car itself and then seeing what fun stuff awaits inside. Hear the bloody birds on the roof. <laughs> Cheeky buggers. Anyway, started cutting this sill off. You can see all the nice crusties inside. Even though from the outside it just looked like the front was rusty. Um, if there's ever rust in the sill, I always just take the whole sill off because if it's rusty in one spot, it's going to be rusty in other spots too. So the inner sill, you can't really see because it's so dark. Uh, maybe I can turn the flash on. No, I'll be back, hang on. Okay, that's a bit better. You can see there's some rust on the inner sill and more bog and stuff at the front of the sill. So by opening all of this up, means we can, well, I can fix all of these problems and then there's more pitted rust and uh, some crusty bits at the in the middle here where it's actually split so by opening all of this up I'll uh, be able to repair it all and then rust convert and paint it all and, uh, should last forever basically after that. So we've started cleaning up the inside of this inner sill just using the wire wheel on the grinder and this die grinder with roll lock on it. So it's pretty gunked up with crap now because the inside of the sill was covered in bloody fish oil which is horrible crap because it just collects dirt. And that's probably why this bottom section is so pitted. And inside of the sill is still wet, so it makes it nice and easy for stuff to stick onto it. And see so even pretty birds, even the old lip. The lip underneath, it's got bog in it as well. It's all full of holes, so I've got to unpick this yet. I just cut cut in the corner to get the sill out of the way to begin with and then I'll unpick this thing now that I've got better access to it and same with around the wheel arch I haven't unpicked that bit there yet either I just wanted to get it off and have a look at the, the inside so now I might do a, a test fit of the outer sill and see how it fits This is the old sill off the Trana that I've just bludgeoned off. And uh, you can see all these bog, bog worms and stuff where they've put filler through the rust. Um, luckily you can't smell it, but the reason I wanted to show you this is you can see there's obviously a, a dampness. And I'm assuming that's because someone's poured fish oil into this. Now my gripe of fish oil, apart from the stench is that I don't think it's particularly good and also it's like super glue for gunk you know, it's stuff like this that makes things rust so anything that doesn't actually dry isn't that you can't get access to for cleaning I don't think is a good idea because this kind of moisture and dirt and contamination is 
is never going to be good for thin sheet metal. So I've just quickly clamped the seal into place. Um, I still haven't trimmed everything out properly, so it's sitting a little bit far back. Because I've just got to trim the, the wheel arch out for this to, to go forward, that extra 5mm. But it fits. It's not full of holes. And you can see, I think I was explaining one time when we were talking about these seals, about having this as a fold. It's just such a neater, a neater finish on that edge. So once that's trimmed out, this will sit in properly and sit forward. This will be able to go in better because this is holding it out at the moment. But overall, I'm I'm happy enough with um with how it looks. Certainly better than it used to be. 20 minutes ago. So, I'll, uh, I'll be back next time I've done something. So before I take this, unclamp this cell and do some work on the inside, I had a quick look on the top section. There's a few little bits that I knew were in there. There's some holes and some interesting stuff up there. I don't know about that gap, that's just because the cell isn't clamped at the top. So I made the first extra top piece that'll just replace that. And uh, I could have folded that in as part of the sill, but then I'd have had to have just cut from there to there off and there to there, plus it would have just made it more of a nuisance to try and figure out exactly where to stop and start this because I couldn't have, wouldn't have been able to get it into position anyway until I'd cut it, so sometimes it's just easier to do it in multiple pieces. Same with that, the A pillar, just because there's going to be so many odd shapes in there that by getting the seal in first it just gives me a like a baseline, something something to build off. So that's why I've done it this way. Also yesterday I was talking about having to unpick all those spot welds. Um, because the bottom of this sill, inner sill is rusty, um, I'm just gonna cut cut the bottom of it off. So that'll uh, get rid of having to undo all those spot welds anyway because that'll all be getting taken off with one chop of the grinder. So that's what I'm going to do now. So I've trimmed that lip off all the way. Let's see where it was. So now I'm going to go and put a little weld underneath where I've cut it, because the floor and the inner sill join together. And then I'm actually going to repair some of this and then add the new seam part on. And then the rest of this crustiness I'm going to fix from the inside because that level there is the floor, so this part is easily accessible from inside the car. I just want to get the new piece welded on then I'll probably tack the outer sill on and then I'll go inside and, and actually fix what I don't fix. Anything basically above where my finger is I'll fix from inside. But from here down is going to be the new piece that, that is the, se the seam at the bottom. Fun times. So I've got a bit of tacking done, so that's the new top piece tacked into place and then the new lower part of the inner sill tacked into place. It's a little bit long, I've added a few bits, a few mil on the end so I can trim it to suit exactly. One thing I will show you 
uh, is put this little 15 mil return on the end here um, mainly just so which I do usually all the time when I do these inner sills on cars just so that it stays straight because it's quite easy for that to go all wobbly and when you're welding the, the outer sill on you don't want the seam to be all crooked so I always just add this little return on just to add strength to this part and then once the the outer cell is all plug welded onto this you can go and just trim this off knowing that it's all straight so I've clamped the sill back on just to have a look how it's all fitting together considering there's only one clamp holding it on it's all sitting pretty nicely so that's looking a bit more solid excuse the camera work so there's the that new inner sill there with that fold on it. So that's a pretty good start. Still got a way to go yet, but I'll, uh, I'll fully weld that inner sill and clean up the inside of it and paint it all, and then I can actually start getting this outer seal welded on. Looks better without all the rust holes in it. Just one more thing while I've got this open. So, so far there's three pieces to this puzzle. There's this one, the main outer seal, and then that strip that's the inner seal. Um, I always find it easier to make the the both sides at the same time so I've got the other outer sill made that's the little lower inner sill and then there's the the top of the, the scuttle area I suppose you call it in the door jam there so all the three pieces that I've made for the other side that we've just tacked on are already ready to go for the driver's side even the little nicks and all the little funny shapes that I've had to put in to make it fit properly that's all all gets done at the same time just because it's so much quicker so I'm just assuming that the driver's side is going to have the same problems so I'm just going to replace all of it as well because it's not that big of a deal to do and when it's someone's pride and joy it's certainly worth doing these kind of steps just so that they're not going to have issues with it in 12 months time A real quick thing too, working um, like in this shed, I work, I start quite early so it's generally dark-ish. So I've got, I've always got these torch things which are battery powered. And then a lead light which is a plug-in job. So it can make a big difference to how your jobs end up looking when you can actually see. So. Uh, if you can, make sure you have access to light because it uh, makes a big difference for me anyway. So, just thought because I'm about to weld this in a sill, so uh, I want to be able to see what I'm doing. <laughs> just welded up the lower sill, inner sill, and uh, gave it a quick sand. I haven't bothered. I'm grinding all the weld smooth because there's just no need. Once the seal goes on, you never see it. There's no weird overlaps or anything, so you, know, you can just get rust converted now and then. Probably tomorrow, once that's dry, I'll chuck some paint on it and then I can start putting the, the seal on. So I've just given it a paint with the rust converter. And then one last thing I need to just mention in case you guys are ever replacing panels is the bottom size of bottom side of this has about a 20 mil uh, where are we well, I can't even see what I'm looking at there there's like a return so what I'll do is I'll measure measure how far out that is 
and then I'll drill some holes in the actual sill so that when the sill's in place I can plug weld it and actually pick this up because obviously the sill was joined to it before so anywhere where it used to be joined you want to rejoin it because it's especially being a monocoque car that doesn't run a separate chassis you need to put all those intersections back together because that's the only way that the car gets its rigidity so that's all I'm going to do to this today because I need to wait for this to dry and it's Sunday and I've had enough of it for today <laughs> so I'll see you guys tomorrow even though it'll probably be now just given the rust converter a quick sand up just by hand with some where are we there 120 grit I think it is 120 grit grit there it is oh yeah thanks to my daughter for making me a pretty princess yesterday <laughs> so now that this is sanded I'm actually going to paint two two um bits of paint I'm actually going to just spray along the bottom here with weld through primer and then I'm going to mask just with a strip of masking tape mask that off and then paint all the rest of it with um, etch primer just because etch primer sticks better than the weld through stuff in my opinion so I'll, uh, I'll grab the weld through stuff and just do my one stripe and I'll, I'll show you how it looks again sorry for the snottiness it's bloody pouring out of me today <laughs> So that's now got a coat of this. So it's silver obviously, which is why it just looks like it hasn't been painted. So you can tell by my overspray that it has. And then uh, the reason I do this is because this bottom lip is going to get the outer sill plug welded onto it. So. Um, this aluminium weld stuff is better at coping with weld heat and being welded in general better than uh, etch primer is. But then etch primer is better at sticking to the the metal and the the bare steel than the weld through primer is. So that's why I'm using a combination of the two. So once this dries. I'm just going to get some 25mm masking tape and tape that flat edge there up and then I'll just paint my etch primer over the top of it all and uh, then the next step will be to drill the sill for the plug welds and then weld it on. So that's that lower edge taped up now. Um, you don't really have to do it this way, you can weld through etch primer. I just find that this works better, especially with plug welding, because it's quite easy to weld through a, a hole that you're plug welding and not actually penetrate through to the, the lower part of the metal that you're trying to join onto. Sometimes if there's enough paint on the, the second layer, um, it'll just weld up the hole, it won't actually join the two pieces together. So that's why I'm doing this. Plus, to be fair, it's only taken about a minute to, <laughs> to spray the silver on and then go and do something else and then come and put the tape on. So it's not like it takes a lot longer, but it's just one of the things that I do. That's kind of why I wanted to take you through the process of this sill, just showing what I do inside these kind of areas. And also, I'll, um, I'll prime inside the sill itself before I weld it on too. Just painted the etch primer. See I've masked a bit on the body too where the sill is going to join on just so I don't have to deal with overspray in the middle of a weld. Well that's all drying out so I've uh, drilled out the sill so there's my holes to pick up that bit there. 
and the rest of these holes go along that bottom seam. And I've also marked, look at that fingernail, wow. <laughs> this was my mark because that's how far I'm gonna cut this bit here back. So I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna drill this and plug weld it when it's getting cut off anyway. So that's what that's for. So I'll get this clamped on and uh, might even chuck a weld on it. Well, she's tacked on. I didn't didn't show you me priming inside the sill because I figured that was probably boring. So I've got this end joined on. There's a couple of tacks. Let's put a couple of the plug welds in just to hold it in place. Now the holes that I've drilled are seven and a half mil, just because I find that's a good size. It works for me. So. Now I've just got a lot of welding to do. Well, it's a good, good start in the repair of this car. A bit more solid metal in there now than there was a couple of days ago. Fun times. Hello. I thought we might have a quick sticky peek at this thing up here. So, Coming or what? I apologise for that nonsense. <laughs> so I thought I might just do a quick example of plug welding. So this is just two pieces. Oh, someone asked me what is this main metal that I use. This is what I use for most of the stuff I ever do is zinc nails, 1.15 mil. Um, the cold rolled stuff isn't what I normally use because uh, I can store this zinc metal for months and months and months and it doesn't go rusty. So this is 1.15 mil and so I've drilled a 7.5 mil hole in the top piece and then obviously the bottom piece has no hole in it at all. So if you want to try and get that to get it somewhere useful don't mind my fingers getting in the way of the camera. <laughs> so, when you start doing the weld, oh, that fingernail is so pretty. <laughs> um, you really want to aim for the center of the hole on the lower piece. If you just sort of weld blindly, you'll end up, well I have in the past, welded, just welded the hole up, having put enough heat into the the base metal. So you really want to aim for that and make sure you get a nice blob on that before you start pushing the, the weld out to the sides. So I might just go and weld this and I'll try and get that I'll get that first blob in the middle and show you what I mean and then I'll weld the rest of it up. Okay so you can see my blob went a little bit over to the side because I was holding this in my hand as I was welding it, but anyway. But I know I've got a good good weld through to the base metal. So now I'm just gonna go in and fill the rest of the hole. I'll probably still, I'll still start in the center. Um, and then I'll basically just circle the hole in the top piece. All right, so it's a bit blobby again because I'm holding this in my hand while I'm welding it. But um, they don't take much to sand these flat. If you if it's in an area where you're going to see it and you want to smooth it off, they're pretty well. They're really easy to sand flat because it, you know, it's like a millimetre high. If that is about the same thickness as the steel, I guess the height of the weld kind of looks higher than it actually is. But, you know, maybe it's a little bit thicker than the the metal but I mean the metal's only one mil and it's got a nice big weld all the way through on the back so that's a successful uh, plug weld and then the things like on this Tirana I'll just lie my fat ass on the floor 
So these welds on the side, I've just had my welder set up the same as I always do. And then when it comes to welding these ones, um, even though it looks like there's nothing in there, it's just got the black primer on it. Because I forgot to paint the weld through anyway. I'm actually going to turn my amps down because gravity and welding don't don't like each other very much sometimes so you can either turn your amps down or you can turn the wire speed up with a MIG um, just to help it not just try and fall on you because the weld is heavier than air obviously so it um it just wants to fall downwards so when you're welding up up above yourself um, either turn your amps down or your wire speed up to cool the weld so that's it for episode 12 I said that's it go away why are you still here i'm still talking to myself <laughs> okay well that is it for this video uh, Kind of had fun making this one, don't know why. A bit more metal work and a bit less of my face. So I've had a few suggestions uh, come in. So I'll, probably the next video will be a suggestion. Um, and I think I'm gonna use my crusty old white ute as a, a guinea pig. <laughs> So uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching and feel free to share these videos around so um, all of the people on the planet can see how festy my face is. All right, thanks guys and girls. See you later. Cheers, bye.